Well, ladies and gentlemen, hello again. Welcome to another Reflected Reality Simulations video. My name's Graham, this is X-Plane 11 and the Rotate MD-80. I've had the MD-80 for a few months now, flying it mostly in X-Plane 10, but I've recently upgraded to X-Plane 11 and wanted to take the opportunity to do a few videos uh, with the aircraft. Rotate supply the aircraft with a good amount of documentation. They've got a pilot's handbook with the uh, expanded procedures and some checklists in there. The checklists and the procedures are derived from the real world uh, operational material. That means it's written uh, with the idea you've got uh, two pilots who are trained on type operating the aircraft. So what I've done is I've taken all that information they've provided and uh, looked at a number of other real world sources and written my own set of documentation uh, as to how to operate the aircraft in a single pilot sim environment. So rather than focusing on a procedure flow and then a check, I've simply written out uh, the procedures with how to operate the aircraft. I've also made available on the uh, xplane.org download site some speed cards that uh, give you the performance speeds for various weights on the aircraft. It's one area I think the add-on is lacking a little bit at the moment, but I've made those available and I'll show you in the video how to use those as well. So we're going to look at a standard uh, cold and dark setup, taxi, takeoff and climb, and then perhaps in the second video we'll look at a descent towards an ILS approach and landing, taxi and then shutdown. We're here at Riga in Latvia and we're going to fly over to Stockholm, Orlando. Total flying time is going to be about uh, 50 minutes and uh, as I said we'll split the videos in two parts, about uh, 40 minutes each for the videos. So the aircraft's on stand here, it's uh, stand 108, it's a taxi off stand so we don't need any pushback. Um, we've got the ground power unit connected but we're not using the ground power so far. So the aircraft's completely cold and dark. Let's bring up the procedures. Now, as I said, these are the procedures that I've written just to uh, help you understand how to operate the aircraft without getting uh, stuck in the detail of how to operate a set of procedures and then a checklist and then having a, a separate crew member to uh, run those checks with you. We're just going to basically read through the procedure and do it. In line with keeping things simple for flight simulation, I haven't included any of the functionality checks, things like the fire bells, that sort of thing, because in real life, if the aircraft generated a fault, you would call the engineer. That's not something we're ever going to do in X-Plane. Uh, we don't have an engineer available, and the aircraft isn't going to fall anyway because it always returns to a perfect state. So it uh, should save a little bit of time. First things first, we're going to check the parking brake is set. That's the knob in the middle here. It's in the lifted position, so it is set. We're going to set the battery switch to on, battery's up here, and if I zoom in, you can see that we can actually lock the battery switch by pulling it down one stage further till the line is in the cross position. With the battery on, we've got DC power, I'll put the nav lights on, on the wingtips. Up here, we're on the emergency lights, and we'll put the no smoking signs to on. Then we need to establish ground AC power. If we didn't have electrical power from the ground, we could start the APU, but that indicates it's available, so let's use that. We'll put the left AC bus onto the external power. The light here indicates the bus is uh, consuming power from the external unit. And we'll do the same with the right bus, so that's both left and right AC buses provided by the ground power unit. Working through the remainder of the overhead panel, I'll switch the galley uh, on here. Coming down, We'll put the anti-fog and the anti-ice on. That's basically the windscreen heating and the windscreen demisting. We'll turn the uh, IRS selectors to nav. We need to align those in just a minute. Working through this uh, panel here, we come down to the yaw damper, put that on, and the logo light to on. The radio rack cooling, we'll switch it to fan. Check the pressurization panel. Make sure that it's set to the uh, field elevation here at Riga, just in case we have a return to uh, Riga as we get airborne. Once we've done that, we'll come on to the main instrument panel. We'll turn up the brightness on the PFD, the nav display, and the FMS. We'll come into the centre of the panel. We'll reset the fuel used with this button here. We'll go to the hydraulic panel. We'll make sure the hydraulic pumps are set to low on the engines. Just when the engines start up, having it in low reduces the load. 
We'll make sure the transfer pump is off and the auxiliary electric pump is off. Make sure there's no inadvertent uh, hydraulic pressurization of the aircraft. The aircraft's got a mechanical uh, trim computer here that indicates the CG position, the flap setting you've used, and the trim. Just make sure that those uh, dials are both set to zero, because if you've left them there from a previous flight, you don't want to inadvertently get airborne with the wrong settings. Finally, on the pedestal, we'll check the transponder, set it to standby, and make sure we've got uh, code 2000 in there. That's basically a, an IFR code that indicates there's no other code assigned. And with that, we're ready to start loading the navigation systems on the aircraft. So we'll verify that the flight directors are selected off, which they both are. It's a single switch, works both of them uh, in the model. Then we'll come down to the FMS. We'll click pause on it, and then we'll start loading the box. I'll put the departure airfield, Echo Victor Romeo Alpha, in. It tells me the... Uh, position from the database and also the position from the GPS. Those two are very close together, so it sounds like a sensible GPS position. We'll use that to uh, align the IRs. We'll go onto the route page and load the rest of the route information. Echo Sierra Sierra Alpha is the destination. We're going to depart off runway 18. We'll load the route manually, so not use the company route procedure. Our call sign is uh, Scandinavian 1747. And uh, we'll load the departure routing as well. So the first point at the end of the star, the first part of the airways uh, clearance would be LAPSA. And then I'll load the rest of the airways clearance. I don't usually bother with the airways um, on this sort of aircraft. Reason being is the aircraft can fly itself quite happily between any two points in space on the planet. It doesn't add any extra complexity for the simmer uh, or any uh, other systems knowledge that you may uh, require uh, to, to make it do this. It's just simply a list of waypoints for the box uh, to follow. But that being said, it's quite a short routing, so I'll load them all in. So Yankee 130 to Rodney, and then the November 623 to uh, Neket, I believe. And then from Neket, it will be the November 616. And that takes us to Zilan. And with that, we can uh, activate the route. We've got to put the departure and arrival routings in as well. This talks you through uh, doing it. What I'll do to make it more straightforward is I'll load the arrival first of all. That's uh, Stockholm ILS runway uh, 26 and the Zilan 2 Victor. And then we'll load the departure. As I select runway 18 for departure, I'll come up to the uh, heading. Make sure I've set 15 degrees angle of bank and scroll to the uh, runway 18 heading, which is about 178. When this aircraft gets airborne, it uh, defaults to a heading select mode. So we'll have that just to indicate the correct pointer. I'll put the lapse of 4 echo departure on there. The lapse of 4 echo stops at an altitude of 4,000 feet, and there's no speed restriction on the departure, so 250 knots. Normally, uh, in the real aircraft, I believe you'd set this knob here to the V2 speed, but it takes an awful lot of dragging and uh, clicking to get it to... Uh, change speed. So I'm just simply going to set it straight to 250 knots. It doesn't have an adverse effect on how the model flies and it just saves a little bit of uh, mouse work in the departure procedure. Nearly there. Click and drag or the uh, scroll wheel doesn't seem to go any faster unfortunately. So we've set the speed, the heading and the altitude uh, for the departure routing. Radio aids, well, we'll just uh, use the GPS to follow it. Notice they've started up with 0, 0.0 uh, in the nav aids. That's simply because I used an X-plane uh, saved uh, situation. There's a little quirk in this aircraft that it uses the X-plane default uh, GPWS. And if you tune the ILS for the departure runway, which is often good practice, it will give you a glide slope caution as you get airborne, which isn't ideal at all. So I'll set it to 117 to make sure that uh, we're not getting anything. There's no ILSs in uh, the 117 frequency. With that, we're just waiting for the uh, IRSs to align, and then we can do the rest of the setup. 
Once the IRSs have aligned, these instruments here will come to life. Scheduled departure is 4.55 uh, Zulu. So we want to start the engines at 4.50, which is about 10 minutes time. See the IRs have aligned now. Before we start loading the performance, it says, well, verify fuel loading's complete. We've got uh, 6.2 tons in, which is what we wanted. I'll set the seatbelt signs to on. And I think it's probably a good time to start the APU just now. So rather than working through the performance, I'll click one page forward and we'll start the APU. Note there's an APU start procedure here, which is when you've got uh, external power already established. There's a second procedure on the cockpit prep that lets you start it from DC power. So let's start the APU. We'll put the aft right pump on to provide fuel supply for the APU. We'll come up here and hold the APU switch to start. Monitor that the APU is starting up. While that's happening, we can probably close the uh, doors as well. So if I go into the plug-in menu and say uh, stairs, first of all. And once the stairs are closed uh, or away, we can do the uh, forward door as well. Watch for the uh, initiator change for the forward cabin door. That's it closed. So APU is starting up. EGT is sensible. And once the APU is uh, started up, you'll see the APU power uh, avail light come on. That tells you the APU is uh, ready to provide electrical power. It doesn't necessarily mean it's taking electrical power. So APU is started up. First thing we've got to do is actually allow that APU to uh, be used for electrical power. So if I flick the APU switch here uh, on the left bus to on, you see the power defaults from the external power to the APU. It decides the APU is a better source of power, and even though the external power is still switched on, the power has gone to the APU. I'll switch that external power to off now, just to make sure it doesn't uh, drop back over. Similarly, we'll do the same on the right bus, and uh, turn the right bus switch off. Once that's done, we're finished with the external power supply, so I'll remove that with the plug-in menu. And then we'd normally wait a minute and then put the APU air conditioning on. Rather than wait a minute, it's not uh, going to cause us any issues at all. I'll turn the APU air supply to on. Come onto the rear pedestal here. Put the uh, pneumatic cross feeds to open. And then we'll put one of the uh, air conditioning packs on. So the left pack generates pressure. And we'll see it's pumping out 40 degrees Celsius uh, air. That's because the cabin's around about 15 degrees, so it should sort itself out in just a minute. APU's running quite happily. About another 8 minutes till we need to start the engines. That seems like a good time to load the performance. So fuel loading's complete. We've turned the seatbelts on. We're now ready to do the FMS work. I'll push a knit ref and it takes us to perf init. I'll tell I'm going to flight level 320. And uh, transition altitude in uh, at Riga, it's 5,000 feet. And the model will pick up the zero fuel weight automatically. If I just click that there, 49 tons is what I expected. Once we've got that, I need to check that this uh, dial here is also set to 49. And leave it for a second, it drops back to gross weight, which says 55.2, 6.2 tons on board. Again, I'll click here, 6.2 tons, 55.2. So the FMS and the uh, fuel quantity measuring device all match up. That makes perfect sense. I'll put a cost index of 20 in and a reserves figure of 3 tonnes. On the takeoff page, I'll tell it it's 15 degrees outside. And I'm going to do a flex departure. So flex will be uh, 55. To set the flex, we come up to this knob here and scroll it forward. Here's flex 55, and I'll push the takeoff flex on the thrust rating panel. Before we enter any other information, I'm going to put the CG value into the calculator down here. That becomes 5, and my departure will be a flap 11 departure. 
So I'll set that as close as I can to flap 11. One of the odd quirks about the MD-80 is that it can pick up speeds automatically for you. But if you click those buttons, it will use the current flap setting. Obviously the flaps are up and the slats are in, rather than the desired flap setting for takeoff. Um, it's not ideal. It would be better if it used the uh, intended flap setting. But that's one of the reasons why I created these speed cards here. Here's a 56 ton speed card, so 55.2, we'll use the 56 ton, and uh, these are the speeds we're going to use here. Rotate speed is 134, V2 speed is 139. You notice the cards have got no V1 speed, that's because V1 speeds in a flight simulator without guaranteed single engine performance or any of the performance charts is largely pointless. If you want a V1 speed, just take uh, 10 knots off the rotate speed. One, two, four, and that should do it. When I push the execute button, you should see it says pre-flight complete, and also it loads the bugs on there. So let's look at the bugs we've got. That's my V1 speed. Rotate 134, V2 139, and V2 plus 15. That's about 156 there. Very similar to the flap in speed, which is uh, ideal. Let's go back to the procedure notes. So we've worked through the uh, takeoff setting. We've set the FMS parameters. The only thing we haven't discussed is the acceleration. I'm going to reduce the power to climb thrust at 1500 feet above the airfield and accelerate at 3000. So I'll just bug the airfield elevation on there. With all that performance loaded and sensible indications on the displays, I'll turn the flight directors on. And once the flight directors are on, come down to the back of the thrust levers, first verify auto throttles off, and then push the uh, toga button. That gives me EPR 55, 4000 feet takeoff and takeoff. It tends to indicate that everything is uh, all sorted out on there. Quick check on the overhead panel, make sure there's nothing uh, out of the ordinary. So yeah, nothing on the NHA to worry about at the moment. And that cabin temperature is uh, sorting itself out. Yeah, it's coming up to about 19 degrees. That's perfect. With that in mind, we're about uh, three or four minutes away from the uh, ideal engine start time. Quick check around the outside, make sure the aircraft's clear. And we're in a good position to start engines. We've checked the doors are closed. You can click the doors button on the initiator. Make sure all the doors are closed. Check that the throttles are indeed at idle. We're going to switch the galley switch uh, off to reduce the load on the APU. And we'll put the fuel pumps on for all of the uh, tanks. So the left and right tanks have got fuel. The uh, middle tank, the centre tank, doesn't have any fuel. So four pumps on. We're going to set the air conditioning supply switch to off, reduces the uh, air demand on the APU to help with engine starting. And we've got pneumatic pressure on the four index there, which is perfect. We'll verify that we've got the hydraulic pump set to low. That means the engines will generate hydraulic pressure as they start up, but it will reduce the load on the engines. I'll put the transfer pump on and the auxiliary pump on. That way we've got brake pressure if we get uh, pushed back and the uh, tow bar fails for whatever reason. Once we've done that, we'll put the uh, anti-collision light on. And down here, set the transponder to transponder. The beacon tells people around the aircraft we're about to start engines, and the transponder tells uh, people on the uh, tower we're about to start the engines. Once we're clear for start, simply a case of uh, starting engines. It's dead easy. I'll set the ignition to system A. We'll start the left engine first. So hold the start valve down, left start valve opens, and we'll monitor the acceleration of the engine on the uh, engine instruments. Looking for greater than 20% N2. Ideally, 22 is the max motoring speed, but anything over 20, if you're impatient, it's uh, not going to harm the virtual engines if we do that. On the real aircraft, uh, you'd have to hold those start switches in position. And in the freeware model of the DC-9, that was the case as well. So I had to bind a keystroke to do it. 
the rotate model it latches those switches in position to make it just a touch easier for you. There's 20%, 21, we'll put the fuel in. Once it exceeds 40% uh, N2, we can uh, close the start valve. So there we go, 40%, close the start valve and close the cover. So N1's accelerating, N2 is just about stabilized, EGT is unwinding, that's a good start. We'll start the right engine using the same procedure. You can single engine taxi on the uh, MD80, but that's uh, a little bit more complicated. So we'll taxi with both engines. On the taxi in uh, at Stockholm, we'll probably shut down the right hand engine on the taxi in. There's 10% N2. reassuringly slow to start. Some engines in X-Plane, they, uh, they really spin up really quite quickly. And certainly my experience of operating uh, larger high bypass turbofan engines is they take a lot longer to start than your general X-Plane models. There's the fuel going in, EGT is rising, N2 is accelerating, N1 is accelerating, looking for 40%. There's 40. Close the start valve. and uh, EGT is dropping back. Good start. So we're finished with the igniters. There's a 10 minute limit on the ignition system, so I'll set that back to off. We'll come up here, we'll get rid of the APU air supply, and then we need to sort out the electrics and the hydraulics again. So the APU is still running. Um, it's still switched on, so it could provide power if necessary, but the main generators are uh, providing most of the power. If we're gonna take off in slushy conditions, I could leave the APU running, uh, in this configuration, and if one of the main engines spooled down for whatever reason, the uh, APU would take over straight away. But I don't need that today. So we'll set the APU switches to off, put the galley switch back on. Fuel heat's here if we need it. It's quite warm today, so not necessary. We'll turn the pitot heaters on by selecting the selector to uh, captain. Once we've done that, we're finished with the APU. So it's basically a, a big loop we do around that panel here. The APU will take a few minutes to cool down and then it'll switch itself off. Hydraulic pumps can go to high now, which we've done. The cross feeds, we'll close those. We don't need those uh, without the, uh, if we're not using anti-ice for the wings, we don't need the cross feeds. And we'll put the uh, packs to on. Once the packs are on, we can do the flight control stuff as well, so speed brakes, then we'll set the trim. We're going to set the trim to the value that's indicated in the long trim window here, so about 8. I can use this knob here to drag the uh, indicator back. I can do it with a trim on the joystick as well, it's a little bit easier. It's around about uh, 8. Check that the rudder trim is neutral. Put the auto brake select to uh, take off, leave it disarmed just now, and set flaps to flaps 11. You can hear the APU spooling down just now. So flap 11 and slats in takeoff position. Quick check on the overhead panel, it says flight recorder off, that's a, a model uh, issue. The flight recorder should be running, but we can't really do anything about that. Center fuel pressure is low, that's uh, sensible, we've got no fuel in the center tanks, and obviously the part brake's on. So happy with everything that's initiated, and we're in a good position to taxi. Once we get our taxi clearance, we'll verify the taxi routing, it's going to be ahead, right, right, and then out towards runway 18. I'll put the uh, nose light on. Start the timer. Be happy about the fact we're off stand four minutes ahead of schedule and release the brakes.
and out we go. I've spent about uh, the past two days messing around with uh, OBS Studio and uh, some microphone digital signal processors to try and make sure the audio quality was a little bit better uh, in the sim. Unfortunately, OBS Studio doesn't really uh, like X-Plane 11 at the moment. It crashes very frequently with the uh, continual cursor changes that X-Plane does. So I'm using the older version of OBS to record this. Um, the model does struggle a little bit on my older computer, but I've got a lot of the detail settings turned down to get reasonable frame rates. Um, when I'm flying it without recording, it's really quite nice. It's nice and fluid. Um, the uh, recorded video source seems to be a little bit more jerky, but that's not actually what I'm seeing as I'm recording it. The computer I'm using is about six years old, and it's an old uh, Radeon 5800 or something. It's desperately need, uh, desperately time for an upgrade. Taxing out here, do a quick flight control check. And then once we're happy, we're on a straightaway here. I'll turn the uh, radar on. Tilt it sensibly, put the transponder to TARE and above, and then finally arm the auto brake. So, flight controls are checked, radars on, transponders to RA, auto brake selected. The last thing we've got to do is make sure that we've got that uh, trim computer set correctly, otherwise, we'll get a config alert. The way to do that is to momentarily advance the thrust levers all the way to the front. It takes a while for the engines to spool up. We don't actually get there, but just to, to demonstrate it, if I was to knock the trim uh, or the rudder set, the uh, sorry, the flap setting off just a little bit, just a little bit further, you'll get the uh, telling you the trim is not in the right position. There we go. If you've been flying the MD-80 and you get these noises on takeoff, 90% of the time it's going to be that um, that tri uh, trim computer. We'll talk about the uh, process of cleaning up the aircraft, accelerating, retracting the flaps and slats as we get airborne. In the speed card uh, download, there's also a guide that I've uh, written that uh, talks about that in a little bit more detail. It's not in the procedure notes um, because it's more related to the speeds and performance. We'll come to hold just briefly on the uh, at the hold short line, and then we'll take the runway. A very long aircraft, the MD-80. Um, the main gear is quite far behind the flight deck, so we'll oversteer a little bit. That's putting the flight deck towards the outside of the turn to try and keep the uh, main landing gear in the middle of the in the middle of the taxiway. Excellent. So set the parking brake here. And uh, work on the basis at this point we've been cleared to uh, line up. What we'll do is put the ignition to both in this case. Put the lights on. All the lights are on. Put the uh, strobes on. The strobes will come on as we get airborne. Quick check we've done everything here. Yep, that's all there is to it. Release the parking brake and off we go. You could switch off the uh, packs if you're interested in doing a packs off departure, but that's not necessary today. And there's no AI traffic around, so I don't need to worry about traffic landing on top of it. If you're flying on Pilot Edge or Fatsim, make sure you have a good look around. Again, oversteer just a little bit to get it onto the center line. So 
So what I'm going to do is advance the thrust levers ever so slightly, and then I'll flick the uh, auto throttle switch on. I've got a button on the joystick to do that. So looking for uh, 40 to 50% uh, N1. There we go. Engines are accelerating together, so auto throttle. That's going to accelerate the engines to maintain the EPR setting. And once the aircraft's uh, got to about, uh, I think it's 50 knots or maybe 80 knots, the uh, auto throttle will clamp the thrust levers where they are. There's the clamp FMA, and the EPR indications are good. V1, rotate, target 15 degrees, positive climb, gear up. I'll just hold it at 15 for a second and then I'll correct on to the flight directors. Above 400 feet radio I can put the nav mode in uh, on the uh, autopilot on the uh, flight guidance I should say. Again there's a button on the joystick. So there's nav track and once you're above a thousand we can put the autopilot in. I'll try and give the aircraft the autopilot in a trim state. There we go, above a thousand, so autopilot one. We can see it enunciated there. Next event is passing 1500 feet above the field. I'll push the uh, climb rating button. We use quite a lot of flex on the departure, that's quite a, a lot of power reduction. So when you change the EPR climb, it doesn't actually make a big difference to the power output of the engines. Obviously if it was a Toga departure, coming back to climb would be a big difference. By this point we'll be speaking to the departure controllers and hopefully they'd clear us up to a flight level. So flight level 160 with the uh, 1013 standard on the altimeters. So to accelerate the aircraft, what I'm going to do is change into the vertical speed mode and uh, reduce the vertical speed by approximately half. If I can get away with keeping it above a thousand feet per minute, that's uh, ideal. There we go, so vertical speed. I'll lower it down to around about 1200. While that's happening, I'll bring up the speed card. And note my flap in speed is 156. That works on the basis I have to maintain less than 15 degrees uh, angle of bank. I'm doing way more than that. So rather than tracking the flaps at uh, flap in speed, I'm going to hold on to the manoeuvring speed of slats only. So once I get to 173, I'm safe to fly at 30 degree angle of bank with only the slats. That's a sensible point to retract the, uh, the flaps. Again, it's all written up in the guide. You can have a read through it a few times to make sure you understand that. But it's once you've done it a few times, it's straightforward. There's 170. And uh, it's okay to anticipate it by a tiny little bit. There's slats only. And the aircraft continues to accelerate. So slat in again, that's uh, 198. Same story, less than uh, 15 degree angle of bank to use that speed. I'm going to wait till 224 or less than 15 degree angle of bank. It's establishing itself nicely on the departure routing now. So less than 15 degrees and above 198, that's sensible. So slats in. Once the slats are in, I can turn the ignition selector to off. Store the speed brake, uh, disarm the speed brake, and set the auto brakes to off. I can also select the trans uh, pump and the auxiliary pump off. At this moment, the engine's making uh, climb thrust. If I was to leave it in a vertical speed mode, it'll go right through the 250 knot limit. If I want it to maintain 250, I can select the speed there, and it'll fly vertical speed and speed. But what I really want to do is to pitch up and maintain 250 knots in the climb. So I'll use 250 as a pitch mode over here.
With the aircraft climbing away, let's check that we've uh, gone through all of the, the climb items now. We've done the thrust reduction, we've turned the ignition off, speed brakes disarmed, hydraulic prompts, uh, transfers off and aux is off, there's the nose light switches, we'll switch those off as well. Aircraft's pressurising quite nicely. Now we could select it over to VNAV, um, if I was to push the VNAV button it wouldn't make much uh, change at the moment, there's VNAV, it says FMS Aper and VNAV Climb. That's another way of doing this part of the departure. Thing is, when you get to flight level 100 in this mode, it will lower the nose really quite a bit, fly level and then accelerate to 30 knots flying level. There's not really any need to do that, so I'll click it back into IS uh, Hold and go back to Climb Rating here. There's Eper Climb and IAS. If you've got it in vertical speed mode here, it should also be in a speed mode on the auto thrust. As it captures an altitude, it will select the current speed as the auto thrust speed, but if you're still climbing and you want to maintain a speed, uh, accelerate to a specific speed, obviously you need a speed mode. It's very similar to the Airbus in that you have to be 100% aware of what the FMAs are telling you. If you have trouble with the automatics, it's probably because you're not paying enough attention to the FMAs. It tells you exactly what it's going to do. And no surprises there. Through flight level 100, I'll turn the lights off. I'll go back to a vertical speed mode, and I'll just bring it down to about 2,000 feet per minute. It was doing almost 3,000 feet a minute with the climb thrust on, so it'll accelerate quite nicely at uh, 2,000. I'll check the climb page here and it says I'm targeting 288 knots, so I'll just keep an eye on the speed trend. If I'm desperately keen I can use the uh, auto throttle speed here, 288, and just use that as a little red pointer. But I'm not going to use the auto throttle, I'm going to leave it on climb rating thrust, and once it gets that 288 I'll flick it back over to IS as the pitch hold mode. It'll pitch up and maintain that speed. Going up to flight level 160, just about 4,500 feet to go. Hopefully, we'd be cleared up to cruising altitude of 32,000 feet. Flight level 320. And also, we can turn the seatbelts to auto. With the flaps retracted and the gear up, seatbelts auto will turn the seatbelts off. And then as we extend the flaps or the slats, it will put the seatbelt signs back on again. It's just set it to auto then if you, for whatever reason you forget about it, you're not going to land with the seatbelt switched off. It will put them on as soon as you configure the aircraft. So this 2,000 feet per minute climb, slowly accelerating. It's more comfortable for the passengers because you don't have a lot of pitching. Uh, and then you don't have a significant pull up as it gets to 288 knots and accelerating. Flick it into IES there. We can make slight changes. If we're going to change the uh, target speed in the uh, pitch hold mode, just do it a knot or two at a time to save any wild pitch oscillation. And once it's there, we can actually use the VNAV mode now. So click VNAV, FMS Eper, VNAV Climb, and it's going up to flight level 320. That's about it for the departure. You'll notice the top of climb and the top descent are very close together, um, so we don't have much time in the cruise on this flight. Once we get to the uh, top of climb, I'm going to adjust the radar, make sure it's pointing level or down. I'm going to select the uh, TCAS system to the neutral position and uh, make sure we've got climb thrust on the box. And I can consider synchronizing the engines as well. Not really an issue in X-Plane because the engines are uh, synchronized by function of me only having a single joystick uh, throttle. So even with the 2K textures on the Rotate Sim model, it's a really nice looking aircraft. I like the Scandinavian colours on it as well, it, it suits the aircraft I think. A little bit more colourful uh, livery on this aircraft. So 
So I hope the audio quality was a little bit better uh, than some of the previous videos. Uh, if you've got any comments on the video or the operation of the aircraft uh, or any questions at all, please feel free to leave them in the comments section below. Thanks very much for listening and I hope you'll join me for part two of the video where we make the approach and landing at Stockholm.